apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertaineth unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye may, might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. I'd like to look this evening at this uh, thought in verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. I entitled this message, The Promise Keeper. You know, they have this movement, an organization, uh, encouraging men, and they have some good points, though they're a universal church, and that's one of their tenets that you basically almost have to believe to be in it called the Promise Keepers. But uh, people often fail to keep promises. That's due to us being in the flesh and coming short. And when we do it, it causes uh, hurt, disappointment. But God's promises are always kept. He never lets us down. And so he is the promise keeper. Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46 verse 9, 10, 11. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I'll do all my pleasure. Calling the ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country, yea, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it, I will also do it. And one of the things that we can learn from that and draw from that is the fact that you know, he said, I have spoken it. If God has made a promise, God cannot lie. And he has the power to bring to pass that which he has spoken and purposed to do. Uh, he is the promise keeper. And we just want to touch on a couple of thoughts this evening. Uh, some of those these exceeding great and precious promises. Now I was thinking about that. You know, it doesn't say great and precious. It says exceeding great. Well, he said, I can do exceedingly abundantly, you know, above all that you can think to ask. Um, so he can do more than what we can conceive of. Our finite minds cannot comprehend and think large enough uh, the things that we ask of God, He is able uh, to do for us. And I was thinking about that exceeding great. Now, some things He can promise, and they may be exceeding great. You know, and, and, and that can indicate something that's very terrifying. You know, when He promises that He's going to execute His vengeance upon the ungodly and those who disobey Him, that can be exceeding great. But that's terrifying. But we see in our text, Peter's talking about to those of us that are saved, not only are they exceeding great, but they're precious. So we take that exceeding greatness, but we apply it to the saved. They're precious to us because they are meant for our benefit. They are meant to uh, be for our good. And so there's a couple of things or three things I want to look at this evening 
There's many promises that he has made. Uh, and, and many things that we could look at. But I want to just uh, limit it to three uh, this evening. First of all, he's promised to us peace of mind. In the Gospel of John chapter 14... And verse 27, he's promised us peace. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And so we see here a, a peace of mine. He says, my peace I give, not as the world gives. Well, the world talks about peace and different things, but it never lasts. But we see here, he says, you know, in the world we have tribulation. We don't have peace. But he says that he gives peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth. And so he encourages, says, let not your heart be troubled. You know, peace in today's world is virtually unknown. As again, as we see human nature, we see the depraved nature, uh, we see how people interact with one another, uh, greed, suspicion, the lack of brotherly or neighborly uh, kindness and love. All these things seem to permeate our society and as a result uh, it prevents any real genuine peace. That's why he said not as the world gives. What we find in the world does not bring peace and you're not going to find peace. And that's something that people look for. Peace of mind. Now, you might be at ease, peace of mind, you know, not worrying, not fretting, not being troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. This world is full of things that would trouble us, trouble our minds, trouble our hearts. Uh, when we read 2 Timothy chapter 3, where Paul's describing the last days, and he's given that, uh, that description there. He said, this know, chapter 3, verse 1, this know that in the last days perilous times shall come. When men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And so he's describing here these characteristics of behavior and things. And certainly, this does not create an atmosphere in which people can find a peace of mind in this world. And that's what he was talking about. He said, uh, I give my peace, not as the world giveth. But we see that God promises peace of mind and heart to those who put their trust in Him. You know, those are in the world. Uh, they look for their, their satisfaction. They look for their life goals. They look for uh, peace and, and success and satisfaction in the accomplishments of this world. And they're not going to find it. Uh, one must look beyond this, and, and as we was talking about uh, this morning, uh, darkness and light, God must shine in our hearts and give us that knowledge that we might believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and we see God, and we uh, uh, gives us the knowledge that we can put our faith and trust in Him. And that's where we're going to find peace, and He's the one who has promised to us peace. Isaiah 26. So I'm not, I 
this Bible. Well, it's, it's got a ways to go. It's not worn out yet, but uh, it just, it's easy to flip through and find things. I got a couple of newer Bibles and, and I don't like using them as much because they're not broken in. But Isaiah chapter 26, verses 3 and 4. He says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. And so he tells us that uh, those who have stayed, our minds are stayed upon him and the idea of stayed is, is anchored fastened to him that he will keep us in perfect peace we was talking about this morning about the perfections of his attributes and so when he makes a promise that promise is perfect our inability to experience a perfect peace is in relationship and proportion to our ability to fully trust Him and keeping our minds stayed upon Him. Uh, we're too easily distracted sometimes. People talk about those that are hyperactive or have attention, attention deficit disorder. Uh, in the flesh, it's, it's hard to keep our minds and things focused on Him all the time. And, and that's the reason we don't enjoy the, the perfect peace. But uh, the peace that we experience will be in proportion as to how we keep our uh, minds and all anchored on the Lord. He said, Trust ye in the Lord, uh, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Proverbs chapter 3. And again, he tells us here, verse 5, 5 through 8. He says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. And this is, you know, talk about health, the spiritual health, the, the peace that we enjoy. If our minds are stayed on Him, and that is the idea of trusting Him. And Proverbs here talks about trusting the Lord with all thine heart. Not to lean to our own understanding, but all of our ways acknowledge Him. Not to be wise in our own uh, eyes and in, in our uh, own thinking, but to trust in Him and acknowledge Him and let Him direct our paths. And as we do that, our minds stay upon Him. He will keep us in perfect peace. Another thing that He promises to us is rest. Rest from labor. There's a lot of labor. There's a lot of things that we labor about. Ultimately, we have that rest. Let's Matthew chapter 11. Let's read that in a moment. Verses 28 through 30, he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now here the rest is not just talking about a, a ceasing from physical labor. Because we are to continue to labor. Solomon in Ecclesiastes 
observing life, looking back over his life, looking back over the experiences of many people that he's observed during his lifetime, through the wisdom that God had given him, and he questions, you know, what profit is there in all that labor that we do under the sun? You know, we labor is part of the curse. From dust thou was taken, to dust shalt thou return. And we would uh, eat our bread by the sweat of our brow until the day that we return to the dust. As part of the curse that is put upon us because of sin physical or manual labor of some sort. But with that manual labor, one of the things that Solomon was looking at is what spiritual, emotional benefit do we derive? And he talks about those that labor that we can enjoy the fruits of our labor. That is the gift of God. A lot of times people work and, and work, but they fret, they worry. They, uh, this kind of goes with the idea of the peace of mind. And we labor emotionally, we labor mentally, as well as physically in these things. And so Jesus has promised rest for our souls. You know, there's a lot of people labor under the false notion that their salvation depends upon their works, upon them keeping the laws, upon them keeping the commandments, upon them doing enough good to outweigh their bad. And they are laboring, you know, trying to do good deeds, trying to be a good neighbor, trying to, you know, whatever, sufficiently to appease God or to please Him and never enough. But when we see and God reveals to us the Lord Jesus Christ that He died for our sins, it's His righteousness that God looks for. His righteousness imputed to us without works. And we can cease from our labor. We can cease from that trying to save ourselves and find rest in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, from that. And one day we will rest from our labors as well. You know, we're to serve Him now, but the day is coming uh, when we can no longer be working. We'll no longer have opportunity to serve Him, but we will enter into that eternal rest that God has prepared uh, for us. The, the resting, you know, the rest for, to our souls is a one thing, but then we will rest from all our labor. And I believe that in eternity, worship and serving Him will not be a labor. But um, even in this life, He speaks of us that, uh, that our love for Him is such that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. It's not grievous, it's not burdensome for us to obey Him and to serve Him. And so He gives us rest. We live in a restless age. Uh, people busy with much serving, doing, and so on. Many times people are so busy working, trying to make ends meet, and I've often, when I think of, of people today, uh, sometimes both husband and wife working, sometimes one or both of them working more than one job. You talk to them about the Lord, you talk to them about going to church, well, I don't have time. And I, I remember what Pharaoh did to the children of Israel in Egypt when Moses came and said God wanted his people to come and to worship him and Pharaoh said they they got too much spare time on their hands you know we need to keep them busy so they don't have time to think about worshiping God 
And so he made it more difficult for them. He increased their workload uh, so as to not allow them that spare time. And Satan is doing that to people today. Through the economy and through different things, the inflation, the, co the cost of living, the, and all these other thing, factors uh, where uh, people are just working and working and working all the time and they do not have time. You know, and the body, the soul, the spirit of man was not made to work seven days a week uh, or the equivalent of that. Uh, you know, you work five or six days a week, but you're putting in 50 and 60 hours a day. Uh, it's just we weren't made to work like that. And you know, and on and on and on. I remember, I did for a while. About four and a half years, I was working 50, 60 hours a week, five days a week. I tell you, it, it takes a toll on you. And uh, it seemed like all I did was come home, fall in bed, go to sleep, get up, grab a bite, and sometimes I wouldn't even eat breakfast. It was too early in the morning. I'd eat off the truck because I had a vending route. Work from five in the morning to nine, ten o'clock at night, five days a week. Seemed like that was all I did. I'm talking about no rest. <laughs> um, but spiritually, people are restless. People are laboring. People are looking for something uh, they can't find. You know, like the rich young ruler that asked Jesus, well, what like I yet? I mean, he had a pretty impressive spiritual resume there, but he said, what like I yet? And people are looking for, they know there's something lacking in their lives, and sometimes they're too busy to really think about it. Some people are searching for that. But uh, rest comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. We see Jude chapter 10. Jude chapter Jude verse 10 through 13. And he's talking about the, the lost, the false teachers and different things in this world. He said, but these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally is brute beast, and those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now look at that. take that verse in our message this morning. The blackness of darkness forever. But he's just, the raging waves, wandering stars, carried about of winds, um, constantly busy. One place he says, ever learning but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. Isaiah 57. Verse 20 and 21, he says, But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. So there, they, it cannot rest. Uh, the only rest we have 
is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus promised rest from the strain and worry of life. He promised rest from the fear uh, uh, consequences of sin, from the laboring to try to produce a righteousness acceptable to God. He's promised to give us rest. And we will cast our care on Him and wait patiently for Him. Psalms 37. Psalm 37, verse 7 through 11. It says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Fret not thyself because of Him who prospereth in His way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. And so he's saying here, you know, not to worry, not to be fretful. Uh, you know, sometimes when you worry and you're fretful, it just wears you out. I mean, that's as bad as working. Uh, the strain on your heart, the strain on your system, your immune system, different things. Physically, worrying and fretting can be harder on you than actual hard labor. So rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for Him. Fret not thyself. Verse 8. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. For fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Um, so, said, but the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Notice that. shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. So he promises us rest and peace. And a third thing that we see that he promises us is strength when we are weak. Isaiah 41.10 dismayed for I am thy God I will strengthen thee yea I will help thee yea I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness and so here he has promised here he said I will strengthen thee with the right hand of promise I will help thee you know we think about ourselves and we have a certain amount of strength But our strength is finite. That is, it's, there's a limit to it. Uh, some are stronger than others. Some have stronger constitutions, health, uh, as well as just physical strength. Some people are stronger emotionally than others, have better coping skills in dealing with the stresses of life. But finite strength is limited and often fails. But God is infinite. His infinite power never fails. And yet many times even those of us that are saved and ought to know better persist in depending on our own limited strength. Notice Genesis 17, verse 1. Genesis 17, verse 1. When Abraham was nine years old, and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Somebody's 99 years old. No 
most of the time they don't have much strength left. Uh, one exception to that rule would have been Moses. He was 120 and said his natural vigor had not abated. His eyesight had not dimmed. But most of us, we, we get to the 90s, we're not as strong as we used to be. And God was preparing Abraham that you're going to be the father of many nations. What, 99? I don't think so. God said, I'm almighty. That is, I have all power. I am the almighty God. In Genesis 35, 11, and God said to him, I am God Almighty. One place he said, I'm the Almighty God. Here he says, I am God Almighty. In both places we see that his strength, his power, is infinite. There is no limit to it. Philippians 3, 3, Paul says we're not to put any confidence in the flesh. You know, the arm of flesh, he says, will fail you. There are many things we can do physically. You know, I can pick up a bag of groceries. I remember... <coughs> This was many years ago when I was working at a grocery store and there was an old man that came in and he liked to make a joke. He said, the older I get, the stronger I get. He said, used to, I couldn't pick up $20 worth of groceries and put them in the car. Now I can. But uh, the arm of flesh will fail you, especially when it comes to spiritual things and the Lord. Uh, physical strength sometimes does not mean we have a mental and emotional strength to bear up under all the trials and, and things that may come our way. And they will, even if we're saved. Saved people, one thing that God did not promise us is that our life would be without trials and challenges. We will have adversity because we have an adversary. Uh, and so I'm one seeking to devour us. So there will be adversity in our lives. There will be trials. There will be testing. There will be sorrow. There will be pain. These things will be done away with in eternity when He makes all things new. But in this present life, these are things that we will face and will experience. And our physical strength is not always... Uh, sufficient in those areas. But 1 John 5, 14, John writes, and this is the confidence that we have in Him. And he's talking here about if we're saved and, uh, and we know the things we ask of Him, then He hears us. He said, this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He heareth us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions uh, that we desire of Him. This is the confidence we have in Him. So our confidence is not in ourselves, it's not in our flesh, our confidence is in Him, in the Lord Jesus Christ. The little children are aware of their lack of strength and depend on their parents. Uh, they, they instinctively know that there are things that they cannot do and they look to their parents to do for them. How much more ought we to depend upon our Heavenly Father and find our strength in Him and in His grace? Isaiah 40, verse 29. Isaiah 40. Well, let's, verse 28. Has
Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary, weary there is no searching of his understanding. Yeah. He's the Almighty. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So God strengthens us. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, He increases strength. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul had the thorn in the flesh. Verse 8. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that, he might, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. That is, God's strength is perfected and, and, and complete in our weakness. When we acknowledge our weakness, and we come to Him and look to Him for our strength, and His strength can be made manifest and perfected in us. He said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I'm strong. Now it seems contradictory. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. But what he's saying is when I'm weak and I acknowledge my weakness and I turn it over to the Lord and I cast my cares upon Him and, and I look to Him and petition Him for His grace to give me strength, then He strengthens me. His grace is sufficient. See, whatever I lack in physical strength, whatever I lack emotionally, whatever I lack in my ability to cope with the stresses of life or whatever, His grace makes up that difference. And there's a sufficiency there that allows me to overcome to cope whatever is, is needed. He said, then I'm strong. These are but a few of the many exceeding great precious promises that Jesus has given to us. We see they began with His promise to forgive us of our sins and to give us eternal life. That's a promise. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's a promise. That's an exceeding great and precious promise. And we're lost. John 5, 24, He that heareth my words and believeth on Him that sent me you know, hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. And when we receive that promise, believe that promise, we call upon Him to save us. He said there, we have this confidence. We ask. It's according to His will. He said, Come to me, call on me, and we are obedient to his command, that's according to his will, and we ask him to forgive us of our sins and to give us eternal life. As he has promised to do, he cannot lie. Then he hears and answers that prayer. We have that confidence in him. 
And then that follows with many more of which of those is his promise to return for us. He said, I go and I prepare a place for you. If I go and I prepare a place, I will come again and receive you to myself. That was a promise he made to his disciples. God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. He will come. He is coming. And I believe it is very soon. All of His promises will be kept. And we can stand confident and secure in those promises. No, 2 Corinthians, while we were there, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. No, that is 1 Corinthians. I mean, 2 Corinthians. Not too far. You can tell I'm getting old. I'm starting to mumble to myself. For 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God in Him are yea, and in Him amen unto the glory of God by us. What does that mean, yea and amen? It means yes. So be it. Let it be so. All the promises of God in Jesus Christ are yea and in Him, amen, unto the glory of God. Let us stand then at this time.